I'm going to start talking about some tomato diseases. And so this is going to be a very brief overview, um, not going in too much into depth on really any, any one disease. Honestly, I could probably spend an hour talking about every disease I'm going to, going to mention here. So um, as Amy said, feel free to throw your questions there in the chat as you, as you have them. But really can't talk about diseases without talking about overall plant health and kind of the plant health continuum as, as I like to think about it. And so plants, they do have some innate resistance to, um, to infection by, by fungi, by bacteria, by, by viruses, same as, same as you and I do. Um, and really the healthier the plant is, the stronger that innate resistance will be. The weaker the plant is, the weaker that innate resistance will be. So whenever you hear us talking about increasing overall plant vigor, that's no different than, than us drinking a, having a big cup of OJ when you have a cold or something like that, trying to get that vitamin C to really um, boost the immune system. Now, at the same time, we have our pathogens and the pathogen virulence or how able are they to cause infection. And really the, the weaker the plant is, the easier it is for pathogens to, um, to cause infection. Meanwhile, if we have a strong, healthy, vigorous growing plant, it's going to be much more difficult for, for those pathogens to, to cause infection. And I think that this is required in every, every talk that discusses plant diseases. We have to bring up the, the disease triangle or the disease pathosystem. So whenever we have disease occur, we need to have these three components occurring um, at the same time. So we need to have a susceptible plant, a virulent pathogen, but also a conducive environment. And together, these are the, the disease triangle. So almost, but almost more important than having these three components occurring in your, in your location is making sure that they are occurring at the same time. And so if, we're, if we don't have that conducive environment, even though we have a susceptible plant and a virulent pathogen, we won't have disease problems. So whenever we are thinking about diseases and trying to think about monitoring, for diseases in the future, we really want to be paying close attention to, to the environment. What's, what is that localized environment doing? That'll give you a really good idea about which diseases you may need to be on the lookout for. Um, and when, as we think, so I, the top two questions that I always get is first, what is it? But almost more importantly, how do I take care of it? Um, what is this spot? How can I control it? And whenever you are thinking about implementing a management, um, a management procedure, you want to make sure you know exactly what you are dealing with before you do that management. Um, the management may be ineffective. You may just be wasting your money if you don't know what disease you're working with. Or in some cases, you may actually make the condition worse. Um, and then briefly, just what are the, some of the common sizes of our plant pathogens and their size relative to, relative to the plant cell? So here I have our prototypical boxy plant cell with our thick cell wall, um, as you can see. And then we have our different nematode or our different pathogen um, or disease-causing uh, organisms inside of this cell. So if you look at the plant nucleus, that's kind of the um, kind of the brain of the plant cell. We have our viruses and bacteria are well, much smaller than the, than, the, than the individual plant cell. Next up, we, um, we have our multicellular organisms, which tend to be our, our fungi and nematodes. And so as we are thinking about fungal diseases, um, especially some of some fungal diseases on our, on our tomatoes, it's always important to, to recognize some of some common symptoms and signs. 
Often it is, um, it's, you need to know, are you dealing with a fungal pathogen or a bacterial pathogen? Knowing which one you're dealing with gives you a lot of insight into, into different management options. So with some of our fungal, um, fungal leaf spot or fungal diseases, we often will have leaf spots that tend to be a little bit round and not restricted by the veins. We may also have a general damping off um, that occurs, especially in the seedling stage. Maybe there is a rapid general blighting of the leaf or some wilts that occur. Other thing with our fungal diseases is we tend to get some of them that can actually rub off on our fingers. And so our ruts, our rusts, our smuts, and our mildews are all fun fungi, and you can just go ahead and rub those off um, with your fingers. I'm guessing most everybody here is well, um, uh, well acquainted with powdery mildew and seen it on pretty, probably every plant in their landscape. That, um, that white growth that you see, that is the actual fungus that is, that is growing. Now, regarding some of the diseases of tomatoes, um, some of the fungal diseases of tomatoes. One of them that I probably get the most questions on in any given year is early blight of tomatoes. Um, and so early blight of tomatoes also can cause, um, cause disease on other solanaceous plants. We do see it quite a bit on, on potatoes as well. But with early blight, um, the early blight fungus is caused by an alternaria fungus but it tends to cause these irregular dark brown lesions. And as the lesions grow or mature, they tend to have these concentric rings in the center of, in the center of the lesions, which you can really see those concentric rings there um, on the picture, picture on the left side of your screen and also um, on the tomato fruit in the middle. And those rings are formed by that fungus um, expanding the area that it kills. And so with each new, um, new area of, of, of necrotic tissue, that's how we get those rings, that, those rings that are formed. And really with early blight of tomatoes, if you are seeing those concentric rings inside of the lesions, you can almost guarantee that you are dealing with, um, with early blight. Uh, those rings are one of our diagnostic features. Now this disease is favored by moderate temperatures, um, approximately 75 to 85 degrees and adequate moisture and um, an adequate leaf, um, leaf wetness period. So the longer these leaves remain wet, the easier it will be for this fungus to cause infection. Now this, um, this disease, it overwinters in infected, um, infected, so, uh, infected debris in the soil. Maybe if you had potatoes there, it can even overwinter in the um, in the tubers um, that, that remain in the soil, or just tomatoes from last year. And as with a lot of our soil-borne pathogens, this often starts at the base of the plant and works its way up. So as we're out, especially right now, as we're out doing some initial scouting, really wanna be paying close attention to the bottom of our plants. And what, what sort of spots are we seeing on the bottom on the bottom, um, those bottom leaves, those older leaves, because as there's more wind, more rain, um, those spores will splash up onto the leaves above and just kind of climb, uh, climb the tomato or, or whatever plant it is, just kind of climb it like a ladder. Now, in addition um, to uh, and so since this, since this disease does reside in the soil or overwinters in the soil, crop rotation is very, very important. Making sure that we're rotating away, away from tomatoes or another solanaceous plant for at least two to three years in that area if you are able. But if you're unable to, then this is something that you may just deal with on, a, on an annual basis. We also want to make sure that we are getting rid of any solanaceous weeds that may be in the garden. If there's any nightshades or anything like that nearby, removing those because they can harbor um, they can harbor the early blight pathogen as well. And then we have early blight's tardy cousin, late blight. Um, and so, late blight, um, as the name implies, tends to show up a little bit later. Now, the nice thing about late blight. If there is, or if there are any nice things about um, about this this disease, but late blight tends not to be a major issue in Nebraska. 
And primarily that's because it, this, this, um, this disease is caused by a Phytophthora fungus or Phytophthora oomycete, so one of our water molds. And it does not do as well in the, in, the in the heat of the summer that we tend to see in Nebraska. So late blight is favored by cool moist night, um, by cool nights with, with high moisture and high humidity, and then moderate temperatures during the day. We do not see much, um, much disease development with late blight whenever we have daytime temperatures above 85 or 90 degrees or so. And so, like I said, normally this disease comes in later um, in Nebraska. And by the time this disease is often coming in, our environment tends not to be as conducive to it as some other diseases. And so again, really making sure that we are seeing, thinking about that environmental um, component of disease is very, very important. But um, one thing you'll wanna be looking for with late blight are just kind of some small water soaked spots and they will very, very quickly enlarge. Um, this, this disease can take out perfectly, um, perfectly healthy, full-grown tomato plants within a couple of days. So really not something we wanna mess around with. And here we have a, um, a close-up of some, some of the small water-soaked spots that we see on the leaves with late blight. Now the last fungal, uh, leaf, fungal foliar disease that I'm going to talk about is septoria leaf spot. And aside from early blight, this is probably the most common disease of tomatoes that we see um, that we see here in Nebraska. And this one often starts with small water-soaked spots on the underside of the leaves that normally have a nice, dark, well-defined margin. Um, that margin is typically brown, but it may even be it may even be blacker. But one of the diagnostic features for septoria leaf spot is if we look at some of those older, more mature lesions, we'll see some black specks forming on the inside of those lesions. And that's what the image we have there on the right is. Those are the um, pycnidia or the fungal fruiting bodies of the, of the septoria fungus. And as with the other diseases that I discussed, this one also overwinters in infested debris or, um, or solanaceous weeds as well. Now, when we are thinking about managing any of these diseases, we always want to start with some of our cultural practices, and such as um, proper sanitation, make sure that we have adequate spacing between the plants, and spacing within the plants, trying to prune, um, prune, as we, um, prune as able. We also want to avoid overhead irrigation, and um, because again, those wa as the water splashes down, spores will splash up. Fungicides may be, um, may be required in certain situations. We also always wanna be looking at tolerant varieties. And I use the term tolerant, not the term resistance, because I'm not a big fan of the term resistance when looking at diseases. Um, true resist or complete resistance is very rare in with a lot of plant diseases. Um, and the image that we have here kind of shows what, what I'm talking about, but for, with insects. And so a resistant plant, the insects will not, be, or the, the disease won't be able to attack it or infect it at all. Susceptible, um, the plant may die due to this disease. Now a tolerant plant is a plant that can tolerate minor infection levels. And so maybe there will be some smot, some some leaf spots that form, but they won't grow terribly large. And we, tend, we, we, won't see a, we won't see too much of an effect on the overall yield um, or the fruit quality with our tolerant plants. Now, the next group that I'm going to discuss are some of our bacterial diseases. These also have form leaf spots. Unlike uh, fungal diseases, bacterial leaf spots often start off start off being somewhat angular um, as they tend to be more restricted by veins. But those smaller le uh, angular leaf spots can, they may coalesce to form larger circular areas um, or just a general blighting that we see. We, we may also see some cankers that form, especially if we're looking at some of our bacterial wilt diseases. Um, there can be cankers that form on the, on the stem and then just a sudden wilting can occur with some of our bacterial wilts as well. 
Now, bacterial spot and bacterial speck um, are the two main um, main bacterial diseases that I that I get questions about in the in the diagnostic clinic. Bacterial spot has small circular lesions with a um, with a normally a very well defined yellow halo, and this one is easily spread through transplants um, or or through infected seed. As we're thinking, looking at the the symptoms on the fruit. Similar to bacterial, um, or similar to the leaves, we'll just get some round black um, lesions that form on the on the fruit as well. Now, bacterial speck. Oh, and I apologize, I have the wrong picture here for bacterial speck. Um, that is the leaf is a picture of bacterial spot um, there, but the fruit that we have is bacterial speck. And so unlike, um, compared to bacterial spot, bacterial speck, those lesions tend to be much smaller. And they're also a little bit raised, um, almost have a scabby appearance. And so you may be able to go out to that infected fruit and just kind of scrape off some of those specks with your fingernail. And that is a, um, a good indication that you are dealing with bacterial speck. We tend to see a lot more bacterial speck showing up um, following a rainstorm where we have um, severe winds or maybe some sandblasting that occurs, creating wounds that allow that bacteria to enter into the plant. Now, one thing to keep in mind about bacterial speck is this one does not infect other solanaceous plants. And so our peppers, our potatoes, they do not get bacterial speck. Bacterial spot can infect all of our solanaceous plants. Um, bacterial speck is not, that is not the case with this one. So as we're thinking about how we manage um, our bacterial diseases, biggest thing to remember, fungicides do not control bacterial diseases. And I will say that one more time for clarity. Fungicides do not control bacterial diseases. Um, so if you are dealing with a bacterial pathogen, you can apply all the fungicide in the world, nothing will happen. You've just wasted your money and you have thrown a lot more pesticide out into nature as well. Similar with, um, with our fungal diseases, sanitation, proper spacing, avoiding that overhead watering and using tolerant varieties is very effective for controlling a lot of our bacterial diseases. Um, but if you are looking for, for something um, that can be applied as a protectant, you maybe wanna look at a, a Bordeaux mixture. And so copper sulfate and lime, has been around for, um, for hundreds of years and is fairly effective at slowing the spread of bacterial diseases. But it does often work better as a protectant than as a curative. The next group that I'm going to discuss are the viruses. I probably get more phone calls um, and email questions about tomato viruses than the fungi and bacterial diseases combined. And a lot, of a lot of unique symptoms with, with viruses, they all just kind of lead to abnormal growth or with an abnormal appearance. We can see. So tobacco mosaic virus, probably the most common um, or one of the most common viruses of tomatoes in Nebraska. This one, the one thing to, rem to, th to remember about tobacco mosaic virus, this one is not vectored by insects. And so this one is spread by either uh, through infected seed or by us as we are moving from plant to plant, especially if we're doing any pruning. Whenever you hear us talk about um, trying to sanitize those, those clippers between plants, between cuts, this, um, this is one of the situations that we're talking about where humans are the main vector of tobacco mosaic virus. The leaves will have this kind of model, maybe almost a leathery appearance, um, they may also turn down, but the nice thing about tobacco mosaic virus is the fruit generally does not show severe symptoms. When you cut into it, um, there may be some brown discoloration inside of the fruit, but in general, the fruit will be fine to, um, fine to consume. Uh, tomato spotted wilt, another very, very common one. Um, this one is transmitted by thrips. So insect vectors are important for a lot of our viruses. Um, this one, um, this one included. 
One of the main symptoms we see with tomato spotted wilt virus are kind of a bronzing of the leaves that normally will have numerous small dark spots um, appearing as well. Now, this can look very similar to herbicide drift as well. Um, so always wanna be um, keep herbicide drift in mind when we are thinking about some of these virus diseases. Now, beet curly top virus, this is the one that I get questioned about the most with people really wanting, wanting to test, um, wanting to test their tomatoes for curly top virus. This one causes stunting and curled leaves. Whenever we think about herbicide drift on our tomatoes, we will see stunting and curled leaves. Um, now, beet curly top, uh, the leaves or the veins of the leaf, the underside of the veins may have kind of a purple hue to them. Not always, but sometimes. And so that's, that's one thing to look for. Um, but one thing I will mention about beet curly top virus is I have tested, um, I was looking back today, I have tested over 30 plants in Nebraska for this virus with people that have said they haven't, they, there's no way that herbicide could be an, could be an issue. Um, and they are convinced that it's curly top. I have never found a positive plant that had curly top virus in Nebraska. So I do believe the virus is out there, but in general, when we're seeing those curled leaves um, and the stunting, really a good idea to be thinking about the, um, the herbicide injury route first. Now, how can we tell the difference between herbicides versus a virus? They both kind of create some of this twisted, distorted, abnormal growth. Um, so, so some things we'll want to ask about, are there any vectors present? Are we seeing leaf hoppers? Are we seeing thrips? Are we seeing aphids? Or any of these other insects that can spread, spread the virus from plant to plant? And then as we're actually looking at the symptoms, we want to ask a few questions regarding symptom distribution. So where on the plant are we seeing it? Is it just the new growth? Um, and did the plants grow out of this injury? With herbicide injury, often it will just be the, the new growth, the, the leaves that are in, um, just in the bud that were hit with the herbicide where we see that injury occur. And if they would, did not get a really severe blast of, of that chemical product, the plants will often recover from, recover from, that, um, from that injury. That's not going to be the case with viruses. Um, once the plant has a virus, it will forever have that virus. Another question we want to ask is, how quickly did the injury occur? If it seemed to occur on multiple plants overnight or seemingly overnight, then again, we want to start thinking about the herbicide drift route. Mean, meanwhile, if it showed up on one or two plants, and then we have slowly seen it spread throughout the rest of our um, tomato crop, that's more indicative of what we would see with a viral disease. And all of this kind of goes back to the um, integrated pest management and the IPM toolbox is, is very, very important. We have a lot of different tools that we can use to manage a lot of these diseases. Um, and making sure that we're picking the right tool, the right management strategy is always very, very important. 